What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining us today for the 1004 Show. We're here with Max DePiro of Casper Drones. It's episode 11 of the 1004 Show. Max, what's going on, man? Hey, how are you doing, Zach? Thanks for having me on. Doing wonderful. You got a beautiful drawing behind you, so I know that if this Casper thing doesn't work out, maybe you being a mathematician or an artist could be something in your life. Yes. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about Casper. I know that it's evolved throughout times. What is Casper? So Casper is a uh, drone for carrying, for, for flying around people. Uh, we recognize that a big problem in the industry is that people generally don't like drones. They don't want them near them. And so we set out to develop a product that could very um, uh, nicely interface around people and sort of uh, help enhance the experience for people rather than turn them away. And so when you say around people, you're talking about like on top of people. So when drones are around people, people are a little timid, a little shy, a little nervous that there is this contraption flying around them that they can't control. And so they're worried about, I guess, their lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're dangerous and they have the, they're really noisy. They sound scary. They have these big spinning blades. And people are, are companies are contracting uh, them to fly over crowds for taking imaging um, at concerts and sporting events and weddings and um, uh, oftentimes uh, in urban environments where they have to fly over over crowds of people um, they're they're scary and and dangerous and so we developed a product that contains the the blades internally so there's no visible spinning blades. And um, by having um, some, by, by containing the blades, uh, the observers on the ground uh, can be shielded from a lot of that noise and we can do things to um, shape the noise. And we've also listened to our customers. Um, so our, our customers are, are the people actually buying the drones and flying them. And their biggest concern was reliability, which is kind of a disconnect from what people's concern is, which is, is um, so noise and safety. And so we, we built into the product um, reliability that no other uh, drone competitor can do on the typical architecture so that we can protect our customers' really expensive payloads because a lot of times they're photographers and they have like you know, $10,000 lenses on these things. And so by providing them with a, a more reliable platform, there's a, a, a safety or, or protection on their on their um, infrastructure. So I think it's interesting. You mentioned that one of the main selling points is the safety of the people below, but they're not necessarily the customer. How do you convince your actual customer that the safety of people below them is something that they need to be thinking about? So in order to, to uh, in, in some cases where accidents have happened, these, uh, the, the production companies and the um, media companies or, or entertainment groups um, that are that are hiring them shy away from wanting to use a drone. So if they can show that they have a product that is um, is more effective at flying over the, uh, their customers, the people that are coming to their event, uh, then they have a better business case and they can expand their market. And that's that's how we. Um, that, that's how we explain the benefit of, of safety and, and reducing noise uh, to them. Let's talk a little bit about you, your backstory. I know you have um, a degree from University of Buffalo. You also went to Charlottesville and UVA. And you didn't necessarily go there to start a business, but you started getting that itch while being at those places. Tell me about the evolution of you and kind of how business started for you. Yeah, so um, I tried starting a company shortly at some point in my uh, uh, graduate school when I was at UVA, and I was working full. I was working full time at NASA and finishing my PhD at at UVA, and uh, wanting to do something in business that would really help people. Um, I like research, but ultimately, um, what I really wanted to do was create products that that I could I could see how it was benefiting society and and benefiting people. And so I tried starting a company um, off of a, a different idea and didn't really gain much traction, got caught up in my degree and, and kept going that direction. And um, when I finished 
my degree and left NASA, uh, this, this idea hit me. Um, as you know, after going to a, a music festival, I was under a drone and how, saw how dangerous and, and noisy, and I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't like it at all, and the people around me didn't. And so I started really researching what the market looked like and realized I have a background in propulsion. Uh, this seems like a problem that is interesting. And so started tinkering, tinkering around and, and ended up building a business around it. Hmm, very interesting. What did you learn from the trying to start a business that you are now able to kind of learn from those mistakes, if you will, or those lessons that have helped you now with Casper? Um, so I've, uh, I've, I've learned, I've learned a lot in how, how to operate a company and operate a business, um, how to tell my story in order to, to excite people about what I'm doing and, um, whether it be, uh, people I want, I need to, to work for me, engineers and, and computer programmers, um, who I'm trying to bring onto the team, or it could be, uh, customers that I'm trying to excite about my product and, bring them on as early adopters or investors um, who I'm trying to, to build a partnership with. So you have an idea. It's about this time last year, so November of 2016. You decide to enter a contest, uh, build a company in a weekend competition. You won that competition. Is that it, do, Doing something like that give you some validation of the market saying, oh, you know, maybe I should continue doing this? Or how did that kind of know. event... I don't know if it was validation of the market. I had that pretty well handled, but it was more so validation of me that I could take all of that uh, uh, that goes into building a company and make sense out of it and then tell it as a story and convince other people that I had a real business. Uh, because at Start, it, it, it's or, or the event is Start Peninsula, you have tons of people coming at you, giving you advice, and you have to be very open to take their criticism, make changes when it makes sense, be able to say no when it when it doesn't, and it's very hard to weed through all of that. And that that start is a very good exercise. Uh, start weekend is a very good exercise in being able to do that. Um, as a business, as running a business, you're gonna have people constantly pulling you in a million directions, and you have to be able to to navigate that effectively um and and the winners that start are, are usually the people who are able to do that so you mentioned talking about you get a lot of advice from someone and you gotta consume it all but then you gotta weed through some of it right and so sometimes i think this is one of the biggest challenges with anyone in business and i believe this because you you have to validate those people actually you have to curate those people and what they may be saying makes sense. But I know that recently I, I was in a startup competition myself and someone said something that logically made a lot of sense, but I had already figured out that that wasn't the answer. And I think a lot of times when people get, um, when they get feedback from someone, it can actually, if you don't know how to weed through that, it can actually be very difficult. So how do, how do you take feedback from an event like that or through conversations with people and, and, and really validate what they're saying so that you don't you don't kill your business because you, you can go in and implement something that they say because it makes sense and you trust them, but it can, it so, can, it can get crazy. So I, I very quickly uh, weed out people uh, who are and a lot of times you have to be uh, uh, you might miss out like that you might be weed out people that that are good but um, I take every single thing it's body language it's every word that they say it's when they're not talking to you and they're talking to other people are they are they nice are they are they good people to work with are they mm. honest and sincere and you'll notice that if I'll watch everyone in the room and see how they all interact with each other and then see how they interact with me. And oftentimes you'll see someone brush off other people, but then try to try to be all cozy with me. And that's not sincere. And so you can, if, if you're always, if you have sort of a big picture and, and you're able to, to observe um, everyone and see how they interact, 
Um, and then you can take what you can start sort of start to filter out. All right, what is this person saying? What is their motivation? Um, and something might seem logical that they're saying, but what's really behind it? Uh, because it, it, like you said, it might seem logical, but it might not be the right thing for you. And, and you have to be able to, to do that. And, and I, I tend to, to, to watch people that I bring close to me. And, um, if I don't feel like they're being sincere, they might be, they might have good things to say, but I, I don't have, I, I just don't have room for that. So I'm a little nervous to be in a room with you now. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> because, no, just to see what you said. No, but I think that's smart. Really don't just look at their words, but look at the body language, see how they interact with other people. It's very interesting. So since that weekend, it's been 12, 13 months at this point, the evolution of that business has changed a lot. The business model, the price point, the name. Talk to me a little bit about how all those things have changed for the better okay so um when i'm as i'm navigating the business I, I i try to go with the flow i i'm i try to paddle downstream and follow how how everything evolves and it it, it plays in with everything for instance the name we were unmanned aerial propulsion systems and now we're called casper drones because it's simple it speaks to it, it very quickly tells people about what our product is um, for a while, our, our, our vision was to build a quiet and safe drone. And then we realized that that's really not what our business is about. Our business is about enhancing an experience for people. So it encompasses everyone. It's a big change because most people don't want to fly drones. So it's a very small market. However, when you change the, just the vision to, we want to enhance an experience for everyone that brings in everybody and makes our market potential massive. And that's, that's really big for, for, for a company. How, why do you think that's that? So you, you just said that your market is, is small because it's the drone pilot, but then you put in the whole experience piece and that becomes everyone. Explain to me how that, how that makes the market bigger, how that makes the, the business bigger. So uh, a drone exists in, in, in an ecosystem and um, everyone who's involved, let's say you're at, you're at a concert and there's a drone overhead, there's 100,000 people that are experiencing that drone all at the same time. And so there's an opportunity to, to um, there, there's an opportunity to reach all those people simultaneously. And if we can insert ourselves in that uh, experience in ways beyond just building a, a platform or, or building a, a physical product that only one company purchases, right? It's just one drone. So there's, all, there's a limit to how much money we can make off of that and how much influence we can have just on that one drone. But that drone operates over thousands of people all at once. And when it's connected to a network can communicate with millions of people beyond that. So by focusing on the experience that all of those people are having relative to that drone, we can leverage our unique platform in order to reach a lot more people. And that's what our business is about. Very and that cool. was a big evolution, a big change for us uh, uh, over the past year. Talking with Max DePiro of Casper Drones, episode 11 of the 1004 Show. If you guys are enjoying this, download it, subscribe it, share it with your friends. If you know someone that is interested in the Casper Drone, share it with them. Let Max, uh, let Max help them. If so, how hard was that to change, like in your mind, knowing that you had this idea, it was getting some traction, you were getting in front of people, you were you were talking to customers, but now you're gonna systematically change everything basically everything that you had started uh you were doing before your everything has changed and so how did you start doing that uh, internally externally to make sure that it was going to be seamless so it what changed was how we tell the story of our company um and it was i was driving home from new york in my car and it just hit me. I was trying to reconcile two different ideas that seemed to fit, but I didn't know how. And, and that's when it sort of hit me that, that really the whole time, 
that's what we were doing. We just didn't know it yet. So as far as like ex actual execution, uh, nothing changed. We still had a product to develop. We still had the same customers and partnerships to approach and and bring into our, our sphere. But um, how we talk to them about what our company is and how big the opportunity is out there, uh, that that was really powerful. And I noticed immediately when we started talking about our company in a totally different light, how we were able to, to bring people in and get them to realize the potential. And, um, and, and so that's, that's the big change that, that it was able to do for us. So instead of saying that your business has a couple of clients, you could say oh, we have you know a huge amount of clients and a huge amount of people and people stopped looking at UAPS at the time as being this small little thing. Instead, started looking at Casper as this, this potentially huge business because it touches so many people and especially when you're at um, a big concert venue with you know thousands of people you know they really can understand why it's there i want to ask you a couple of questions about just building the product and, and getting it out there you're an engineer by trade stereotypically generally people say that engineers are put something together that's very very solid but then the business side of it sometimes misses out how have you been able to build a product and the business at the same time um so one of the best things i did was hire a full-time engineer and a few part-times and so i've been able to more direct the engineering and rather than actually doing it so i've i've really backed out and taken my hands off a lot of that work and it allows me to focus on looking at the market and finding um, strategic partners who can help us uh, develop our product and then uh, distribute it and manufacture it and um, sell it. You don't have a business degree or anything like that though, right? I do not, no. Do not. So how, do, how have you learned kind of the business side of things? So I have a really great board of directors. I have about uh, four other uh, individuals on my board each have about 30 years of experience in business. Um, one of our recent investors, uh, he's just been awesome in helping us build our beta um, version, uh, figuring out how to how to approach enterprise partnerships. Um, we have a, another legal advisor who is also has experience in startups, uh, and then an accountant and a business advisor. Uh, we signed with a big name legal firm, Cooley LLP. And they've been amazing partner in, in helping us uh, navigate different IP and branding um, strategies. So if you don't have a business, if you don't have a lot of business experience, a, a great way to do that is put together a, a really strong board that can guide you in that process. Absolutely. Very cool. That, that is the way. And they'll teach you what you don't know. They'll fill the gaps that you can't fill. Um, they've been amazing. What is next for Casper? What's on the horizon? Uh, so most recently, we, we're finally uh, flying and getting the thing, um, the control systems down. So that's a technical product development. We're going to be launching our beta version. We're calling it the Casper beta program. And we'll be signing in customers under a contract to use our product uh, generate use cases. We can figure out, uh, really uh, narrow down what our what our product market placement is or product market fit rather. And then we'll be um, and then we'll be launching. Uh, hopefully next year, about this time next year, we'll be launching our first version of product to the market. Very cool. I want to ask you a couple of personal questions about just the way that you think, and stuff like that. What is your favorite quote to live by? Um, shoot, there's a, there's a quote by Steve Jobs that he gave at, um, at the commencement ceremony at, at Sam, uh, the Stanford, at, at Stanford. um, oh, why can't I think of it? But, um, well, maybe you'll get to it, uh, after these other ones. What about your favorite yeah. book? My favorite book, uh, I'm a big fan of Charles Dickens, actually. Yeah. And I, uh, I like, I like to be able to read, he has some really great, uh, uh, just the way he, he describes things. And I don't feel obligated to finish the whole book cause they're like that thick. Uh, is there a specific so like one that you like the most? 
So right now I'm reading um, Little Dorrit. And actually just recently I picked it up and and read a couple – all I had to do was read a couple pages and he just – he just said something really profound that kind of fit uh, uh, fit my life right now. It was, it, was, it was really interesting. Everything happens for a reason. I love it. Um, tools that you cannot live uh, without. Tools that I can't live without. Yeah, um, online, physical, whatever it is. I mean, my phone and my computer. Yep. Uh, my car. If you had to give up one of those, what would you give up? Probably my computer because I can do everything on my phone. Hmm. I would have said your car because then you could have Ubered everywhere. Um, I love my I love driving. There you go. Okay. I do my best. I do some of my best thinking behind the wheel. You know it's interesting. I don't I don't drive a lot, and so when I do, it is nice to just you know think and, and to be doing stuff like that. You you talked about Steve Jobs and his quote from Stanford. The is he someone that you follow or, or what type of people do you follow to try and, and look at them and say, you know, they've really been able to evolve, not just their lives, but this, this crazy audacious goal or life. Who are you looking at um, when it comes to that? I watch a lot of videos on Steve Jobs, just um, presentations that he's given. I don't idolize him, but I do respect him. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of, he had a lot of really great managerial qualities um, and the way he thought about business and thought about developing a product or service to, to deliver to people. I think um, uh, uh, Elon Musk also has a, like, like I look at, I follow Tesla's business model of having a very user centric uh, uh, approach when they design their product. Like they entered a very entrenched market, the automobile industry and yet have been able to produce a product that that thing could be a gas engine and I would, it would still be a beautiful car. If you've ever sat in it, he just, they did an amazing job at understanding what a driver really needed and wanted and, and delivered that. And was that answer that they don't want to drive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently, apparently. Apparently, apparently. Do you remember the Steve Jobs quote? I haven't yet. I, I, I'll, I'll look it up. I'm it was very short. Um, there was a lot. That's a great. It's a great talk for anyone that is just looking to be inspired, and it's. Um, I've 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 watched that a couple of times. What's something about Casper that people don't know that they should know? That a drone doesn't need to look like a drone. Everyone, you hear a drone and you think a quad, a, a multi rotor, big open blade system that sounds noisy and. What Casper is going to change is what people think of when they think of drone. What's been the toughest part since starting the business? Um, dealing with the the ups and downs. Um, I've had to deal with it in uh, uh, different ways, especially with a PhD, but the constant... Um, up and down of of, uh, of of your survival hinging on this company being successful and your ability to, to not just deliver and execute on everything you, you say you're going to do, because I'm, I'm good at that part. I'm, I'm really good at execution, but being able to communicate that to people because you can't do it alone and having everything hinge on your ability to do all those things, that's that's really difficult. So what do you do to improve that? That's a great question. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to really um, peace, be peaceful in my mind and, and understand that um, and, and have a really good grip on reality. I talk about this all the time because it's really hard. It's really easy for entrepreneurs to get caught in uh, whether whether it be too high or too low, you know, very excited or or very depressed, be caught in not reality, and there's a word for that, I'm sure. Um, but I feel like if I if I maintain my grounding and and use the people around me to keep me grounded on what's real and what isn't, uh, then that's how I I, I can I can navigate um, navigate all of that difficulty powerful i think you're 
you're onto something there. I think that, you know, entrepreneurs take a lot of risk and a lot of people, most people aren't entrepreneurs, right? Some people are now calling themselves entrepreneurs and they're really not, not entrepreneurs, but the real entrepreneurs, the people that are really taking big risk and trying to change their lives and, and do some crazy impacts in the world, you know, most people aren't those people. And so, but society is filled with those people, we'll just call them the general public, and they don't understand it. And so you see one thing and your your mind is consumed to listening to that message. And I think that it's not, it wasn't marketed towards that message. And so we have to then, I like the word you use, ground ourselves back into it saying, oh, actually that that's nothing for me. Right. So when people say I'm excited for the weekend, I'm excited, I'm excited for my two weeks of vacation off. I'm excited for all these things. Those are all great and dandy. But when you own and run a business, you have to look at things a little differently. And so I think it's mm -hmm. it's important that we as entrepreneurs recognize that the majority of messaging that we're seeing was not directed towards us. Therefore, we cannot consume it and try and live by that type of way. What? What have I missed? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Is there anything that you want people to know about Casper that they don't know about? Other than it being, you know, it's going to look different than it has in the past. Um, I don't, so we're, we're very much under the radar right now. We're in, in stealth mode. Uh, I think very soon people are going to start hearing about us in the next year. And uh, for right now, just know that, that pe people should know that, that drones are not always going to be the way they, they are today. Uh, how are you going to go from stealth mode not um, to people knowing about you then? How will we go from that? Yeah. Uh, so it'll it'll start slow at first with our with our beta program, um, just by us individually getting in front of customers. Um, but eventually, we're gonna do as, as we take on bit larger investments. We'll do big press releases and um, launch our product uh, to the market in a big splash. Big splash, always good. What um, from raising money? I know that you won some capital from a competition. You've had a couple of investors. How has that process been of, of trying to acquire capital to grow your business? What are some things that you've learned from that process? Uh, it's, 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 it's challenging because we're competing against, you know, I'm a hard, we're a hardware company uh, first, right? Our first step is building a drone and we're a software company second. Uh, I try to show that as an advantage. However, we're competing against software companies, which have very low capital cost and can show how quickly and cheaply they can reach millions and millions of people with their product. And for an investor, that's that's really enticing. And, and that's why you see a lot of investment going into software. Uh, so a lot of the venture capital um, organizations that we, we go to mostly or, or exclusively do software, and um, and they're they're hesitant to get into to hardware. I also notice, especially being on the East Coast, uh, that I have a an added case that I need to make for my company. Uh, that the East Coast is the best place for for my company to grow. Um, there's a uh, I, I wasn't really a, a big believer in this, but there's a big difference between West Coast capital and east coast capital oh yeah and they're there I, I was trying hard to not believe it but the more i dig in uh to try and raise money the more i'm starting to see that i think there is a difference and and i'm hoping that like uh hubs like dc and new york and and boston are starting to grow out of that but um i think they're still very very much in in software and healthcare and making the case that that a hardware company is worth investing in what are some of those big... how do you convince them then so if you if if you have a bigger risk because there's a physical component of it what are some of the ways that you show them that hey actually this is potentially a bigger fit because there are obviously there are... there are players that are 
doing hardware with software. So what are some of the ways that you're convincing them? So it's a lot easier for a hardware company to move into software. And it's a lot harder for a software company to move into hardware. And by developing a unique hardware platform that we can leverage to distribute our software um, uh, services and capability, uh, will uh, um, be a much stronger, uh, give us a much stronger foothold in the market than if we were to do the opposite. And so, yes, we're go, we are, we are doing the hard thing first, but it's worth spending money on the really hard thing first. And then moving into, once we have a platform to distribute, uh, moving into software where we can really explode and, and reach everyone. And that's, that's great. Max Shapiro, I appreciate your time. CasperDrone.com, CasperDrone.com, episode 11 of the 1004 show. Max, appreciate your time. And we will be looking for Casper in the sky very soon. Indeed. Thank you, Zach. Absolutely.